Uh, so, to introduce today's speaker, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Jacob Dalton. He's the Kent State Foundation Distinguished University Professor of Tibetan Buddhism at Berkeley. Uh, Ina has written out a lengthy introduction for me to read. I'm not going to read that, uh, but I will say, um, before I begin praising him effusively, uh, as a truth in advertising that uh, Jake was our student here, uh, graduated in 2002. Uh, after that, uh, he received a postdoctoral fellowship, was it right, uh, for three years at the British Library uh, in London, where he was given unlimited access to the Tibetan manuscripts that had been looted uh, from the library cave of Dunhuang by uh, R.L. Stein in 1907. And of course, just across the English Channel in Paris in the Bibliothèque Nationale were all of the Tibetan manuscripts looted in 1908 by Paul Paleo, uh, an even greater collection and Jake was given unlimited access to these works, and this was, I think, a career-changing uh, period in his uh, early career. Because while he was there, he discovered uh, a manuscript, a fragment of one that was in London, with some brilliant detective work. He found, it, found the other half in Paris, put them together, and discovered uh, a, a ritual text which seems to describe uh, human sacrifice. Uh, that text became the basis of his award-winning book, uh, The Taming of the Demons. Uh, and unlike all academics, he published that before he published his dissertation. Uh, after that, he was hired at Yale uh, and stayed there for three and a half years uh, before uh, receiving this distinguished chair at Berkeley. So it was not that he was leaving Yale like so many assistant professors because he didn't get tenure. Uh, he left because uh, he received this distinguished chair, went on then to publish his dissertation called The Gathering of Intentions, which came out recently. Uh, he also went to Berkeley to be reunited with one of his Michigan mentors, uh, Robert Sharp. So he's now uh, happily returned to the Dunhuang materials, and he's going to be giving us a presentation on some of his latest work uh, today. So please welcome Jake Dalton. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you, Don, for that nice introduction. <laughs> it's very nice to be back here. I was walking around the streets yesterday feeling quite nostalgic and sort of old, <laughs> or older than I normally think of myself. Um, uh, and um, thank you, Eric and the graduate students in Buddhist studies for this very nice invitation, and uh, Ina for all your help. Uh, with the arrangements. Uh, this talk, uh, I'm in the middle of, I'm on sabbatical in the middle of writing this book that, um, so Don talked about these manuscripts that I worked on and uh, basically I was just saying yesterday that I, I, when I got there, I, there were so many incredible treasures I got carried away and fired off a couple of articles thinking, oh my God, I've got to publish on this right away and um, made a couple of sort of embarrassing mistakes and realized that, whoa, 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 I need to sort of uh, back up and educate myself about the context um, of these manuscripts, which are kind of a window into this crucial moment when tantric Buddhism is just emerging. Um, and uh, so it's taken me the last 15 years to uh, re-educate myself about all of this, and I'm finally coming back to write this book. And the talk today is, it's a little um, <clears throat> uh, making grand claims, but uh, it fits within a larger argument, a larger book. And this is kind of the central chapter uh, of the book. And I'm a little worried about time, so excuse me if I speak a little quickly. Um, OK. Slide. It happened when they were staying together in one of the hermitages high up in the mountains above Dzogchen Monastery. It was a very beautiful night. The dark blue sky was clear and the stars shone brilliantly. The sound of their solitude was heightened by the distant barking of a dog from the monastery below. <laughs> 
Satya Rinpoche was lying stretched out on the ground doing a special Dzogchen uh, practice. He called Nyosho Lungtok over to him saying, did you say you don't know the essence of the mind? Nyosho Lungtok guessed from his tone that this was a special moment and nodded expectantly. There's nothing to it really, Satya Rinpoche said casually and added, my son, come and lie down over here. Be like your old father. Nyoshu Lungtok stretched out by his side. Then Patra Rinpoche asked him, Do you see the stars up there in the sky? Yes. Do you hear the dogs barking in Dzogchen Monastery? Yes. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? Yes. Well, the nature of Dzogchen is this, simply this. Nyoshu Lungtok tells us what happened then. At that instant, I arrived at a certainty of realization from within. I had been liberated from the fetters of it is or it is not. I had realized the primordial wisdom, the naked union of emptiness and intrinsic awareness. I was introduced to this realization by his blessing. As the great Indian master, Sarah has said, he in whose heart the words of the master have entered, see the truth like a treasure in his own palm. At that moment, everything fell into place. The fruit of all Nyosho Lungtok's years of learning, purification, and practice was born. He attained the realization of the nature of mind. So this story and many like it are well known in Tibetan Buddhist circles. They represent the ideal Buddhist teacher imparting to his disciple a direct experience of awakening. Placed alongside the uh, koans or gongans of, of Ch Chan and Zen Buddhism, many would say these moments epitomize Buddhism. Scholars might critique such views, however, of this complex and ancient religion as redu reductionistic or essentializing. Yet the stories remain powerful in the imaginations of modern Buddhists across East Asia. With my time here today, I want to suggest that the idea of a Buddhist teacher or text using poetic language to evoke a certain experience in his disciple has long been a part of Mahayana Buddhism, but that it has not always been so. More specifically, I want to suggest that this idea first arose to the fore around the 8th century, and that it was rarely seen in the Buddhist literature before this time. I do not mean to suggest that Buddhists didn't have flashes of awakening before the 7th century, uh, Shakyamuni Buddha had, has, uh, had always been understood to have undergone some kind of unimaginable shift in perspective while sitting under the Bodhi tree some 2,500 years ago. And certainly his followers sought to replicate his experience through their practices from the very beginnings of Buddhist history. Early scriptures suggest that the educated Buddhist will feel moved experiencing some vega by the seeing the four sights where the Buddha was born, awakened, taught, and passed away. And stories abound of disciples attaining awakening upon hearing the Buddha teach. In Ashvaghosa's second century literary masterpiece, the Soundarananda, for example, upon hearing the Buddha speak about faith, Nanda, quote, was filled with utter joy as though he'd been sprinkled with the elixir of deathlessness. The perfectly enlightened one considered him to have virtually reached the goal by means of faith, end quote. Yet the idea of a teacher in person or through his writing, specifically setting out often within a ritualized context to engender such an experience in his disciple through the use of poetic expression was something quite new. Its appearance marked a shift that was just one part of a much larger nexus of developments within Buddhist practice in the seventh and eighth centuries. These developments began in India, but spread very quickly to Tibet, China, and beyond affecting a change in practice so thorough that today we find it hard to imagine Buddhism without it. Here I should uh, take a moment to highlight the work of my colleague at UC Berkeley and previously here at Michigan, Don just mentioned him, Robert Scharf, a specialist in Chinese Buddhism who's argued that, quote, the role of experience in the history of Buddhism has been greatly exaggerated in contemporary scholarship. Both historical and ethnographic evidence, he writes, suggests that the privileging of experience may well be traced to certain 20th century Asian reform movements 
notably those that urge a return to zazen or vipassana meditation, end quote. Contemporary scholars, in other words, make too much of subjective experience in Buddhism, and they do so, Scharf continues, under the influence of the Western Enlightenment, from Cartesian metaphysics to the romanticism of Schleiermacher and Dilthey to the mysticisms of Rudolf Otto and uh, William James. Scharf's warnings in this regard are well taken, and his arguments are admittedly more complex than I'm giving them credit for here, but we may also observe that they assume an emphasis on the subject, subject and subjective experience of the sort seen in the European Enlightenment and Romanticism, uh, that an emphasis on this kind of subjective experience of the sort seen in the European Enlightenment and Romanticism uh, is entirely unique to the West. Without question, both the Enlightenment and Romanticism are Western movements with deep roots in European thought, but are they without any parallels in the history of other regions? Might there not be other movements that occurred elsewhere where we may see at least partial reflections of our own modernity? Certainly, Scharf is not alone in suspecting that where we see an emphasis on subjective experience, we likely see the influence of modernity on the West. We see similar tendencies in literary studies where scholarly and artistic interests in subjectivity and aesthetics are traced to Kant's critique of judgment and typically held to be unique to modernity. Of course, they are in their modern Western forms, but beyond the West, there is more to be said. Witness, for example, the Indian aesthetic theory of the eight and later nine moods or rasas that date back some two millennia to Bharata Muni's Natya Shastra and the turn of the common era. To ignore such non-Western systems of aesthetics and so on is to miss some potential points of contact, places where we can build bridges of understanding between ourselves and the pre-modern traditions of other cultures and historical periods. So I want to suggest that Scharf's warnings against projecting modern Western interests and experience onto pre-modern Buddhism can be taken too far and lead us to miss an intriguing shift in the development of Buddhist practice. As I have already said, Buddhist involvements in ritualized poetic evocations of subjective experience arose within a larger nexus of developments. Given the intricacies of the shifts involved, where can we begin? Which thread shall we pull out and follow first? <coughs> I would suggest we start with the genre of ritual manuals. What better place to look for shifts in lived religion? and how Buddhist practitioners interact with their traditions. Ritual manuals have long provided a, a literary space for intensely personal explorations of Buddhist practice. If we were to find evidence of a movement toward the evocation of affective experience anywhere, surely this would be a place to look. Fortunately, a number of early ritual manuals have been preserved among the manuscripts found in this uh, famous library cave of Dunhuang. a city that historically served as China's gateway to the ancient Silk Road. A time capsule of lived Buddhist religious practice, the Dunhuang collection contains hundreds of ritual manuals, invaluable windows into the early history of tantric ritual practice outside the reach of the canonical tantras. Elsewhere, I've observed that the genre of ritual manuals emerged within Buddhist circles around the mid fifth century initially in connection with the Mahayana Dharani Sutras. The latter were uh, relatively standard Mahayana Sutras that typically revolved around one or more Dharani spells that could be recited to various ends. The first Dharani Sutras began to appear in the early centuries of the Common Era, and from the mid-fifth century, they began to be accompanied by an assortment of short ritual texts called Vidhi, Kalpa, and so on. These early ritual manuals that gained increasing popularity through the sixth century, proliferating rapidly throughout India and beyond, many even entered, uh, entering the Chinese canon. This was unprecedented. Never before had such a number of locally produced manuals played such a central role in orthodox Buddhist practice. The rites they prescribed were increasingly complex and of a completely different order from those practiced before. No longer mere liturgies, 
The Dharani-based ritual, uh, rituals placed a strong emphasis on arranging a ritual space and performing physical activities within that space. Key to these earliest manuals was an increasing interest in images and image worship. And this was true not only, across, uh, not only uh, for Buddhism, but across all three of the orthodox religious traditions of India, meaning Jainism and uh, Hinduism as well. With the seventh century, another major shift began to unfold across all three traditions, one that was in large part facilitated by the now widespread uh, ritual manuals and their countless innovations. In the seventh and eighth centuries, the first properly named tantras emerged. And these new scriptures marked a sea change in Asian religious practice. With them came an interlocking set of elements involving, and this is significant for our purposes, the inner world of the imagination. In the earlier Dharani-based manuals of the sort see, uh, just described, the practitioner would sit before an altar, termed a mandala, and direct her oblations to the Buddha at its center. Now, with the tantras, such a practice was accompanied and sometimes even replaced outright by a completely new perspective, an imagined level on which the practitioner herself is the Buddha, seated at the center of this mandala and receiving the offerings. When both the physical and the imagined levels were retained, the practitioner might even place the prescribed offerings before the image on the altar in front of her, even as she simultaneously imagined herself as that same Buddha receiving the offerings in a purified form from imagined offering goddesses. So tantric ritual unfolded on two registers, the outer, which was visible to anyone present, and the inner, which remained invisible to most people. And it was on this inner level that the real rite was held to be taking place. It was on this imaginary level, from this new perspective of the ritual subject at the center of the mandala, that the rite's true power was generated. And thus, one 8th century commentator explains how the ritual master, in order to draw a physical mandala, you see in these monks making these sand mandalas and so on, so in order to draw a physical mandala upon the earthen platform, uh, one should first imagine the intrinsically existent mandala in, in the space above the platform. Only on the basis of this imagined true mandala, he explains, can its reflection be drawn in paints or colored sand. Such new tantric manuals added to the instructions of the earlier Dharani-based rituals, which focused on the, Buddha's, uh, on the readers' bodily actions. Uh, they added detailed descriptions for the practitioner to imagine. And imagination in this context was no sad facsimile of reality, quite the opposite. It was the root of all phenomena. It was perhaps not a coincidence that the influential Indian philosopher Dharmakirti, who dated from the same 7th century and single-handedly set the terms for Buddhist thought going forward, placed a kind of subjective phenomenology at the heart of his philosophical project. The tantric imaginary, invisible as it was on the physical plane, was also accompanied by a new rhetoric of secrecy. This realer than real level on which uh, tantric ritual unfolded was invisible, the tantrics claimed, if you had not received the proper initiations. Tantric initiation was now requisite before any of these new rites could be explained, and once initiated, you were not to speak about the relevant rites to anyone outside the circle. For the first time, the Buddhist teachings were no longer to be propagated freely. Now, these most efficacious of practices were to be withheld from all but a small circle of initiates, and dire consequences were threatened for any who might break this rule. Within the circle, coded language began to be used and multiple levels of meaning were ubiquitous. A statement made within this highly ritualized context could be understood on an outer or an inner and sometimes even a further secret level, with the latter meaning, uh, with the latter meaning being determined through complex systems of mystical associations known only to initiates. Secrecy, initiation, imagination, and self-identification with the Buddhas. All these elements work together to shape this new approach to Buddhist ritual, an approach that, and this is my main point, was strongly focused on the subject. 
It may not have been quite the same subjectivity as that of Kant and Bert before him, who clearly rooted the aesthetic in the subject, but early tantric Buddhism too saw subjective experience as a central realm of exploration. Excuse me. Okay, hopefully this review gives you some feel for the general historical and ritual context that gave rise to the texts I want to present today. Now I'd like to turn to the question at hand, namely the introduction into ritual manuals of poetic passages that seek to communicate a particular affective experience in the reader. Any number of examples could be given, but I'll be focusing on two kinds of moments that occur at different points in a typical ritual ceremony. First, in the middle of the ritual, when one affects one's imagined identification with the Buddha. And then second, at the end, when the imagined scene is dissolved back into emptiness, that is, into the ultimate state of awakening. Some of the earliest tantric manuals I've worked on are particularly interested in the practitioner's imagined union with the deity. Indeed, this early class of tantric ritual is known as the yoga tantra class, where yoga here means precisely union, the term being etymologically related to the English yoke. IOL Tib J 417 is a ninth century manuscript stored at the British Library that provides a good example of this kind of manual. As is typical in such works, the procedures described for becoming the Buddha include two stages. This gets a little complicated. Um, uh, here we go. Uh, first, one generates, so these are the two stages. And first, uh, one generates oneself in the form of the deity, and then, in the second stage, you install the, de the actual deity within that appropriately formed vessel. So, stage one, when you generate yourself just in the form, the sort of empty uh, form of the deity. This stage follows a series of five steps, the well-known Panchabhisambodhi Krama. First, one performs an analytical meditation on the nature of one's ordinary body, breaking it down into its smallest components, atoms maybe. Uh, then one uh, analyzes those parts and recognizes that even those atoms have sides, a front and a back and so on meaning that the atom itself can be further broken down into still further parts. And then you can do that to each of those parts. And at some point, one recognizes that this logic implies an infinite regress, and that, and that there are no ultimately stable components that constitute one's body. One thus has a glimpse of emptiness. Second, one then recognizes that this means the body is constituted in part by the perceiving subject who ignores the body's lack of any external ground and, and lack of ultimate existence, but nonetheless perceives it as a body. In this sense, the body is founded as are all objects on nothing but mind, called mind only in the text. This knowing mind then takes the form of a full moon disk resting horizontally in the emptiness. Third, this moon disk gives off light rays that pervade the universe and then return to collect upon the disk, the moon disk, in the form of a syllable. This is the heart essence of one's deity. And fourth, that syllable again gives off light rays that return again to transform the syllable into a symbol. It could be a vajra or a jewel, a lotus flower, depending on one's uh, specific personal tutelary deity. And fifth, Finally, the light rays emanate once more from this symbol and regather to transform it into the form of the deity. And thus ends part one. You're now, you have the external form of the, the, your deity. Having thus established oneself in the form of the deity, one now consecrates uh, that form with the actual deity, drawing the, Buddha's, the Buddha into one's body, which now is the form of the deity. This is accomplished by putting one's hands in a particular formation, both hands clasped together with the two middle fingers extending straight up, uh, and then uh, gazing at this mudra, one pronounces a, a Sanskrit mantra, which is, in effect, you are the deity, samaya stvam. And there's a whole thing in the background here about samaya, the fact that I'm translating it as the deity uh, is 
to do with what's happening at this moment when the word had a, quite a different meaning from what we think of today, but it basically is the mind of the Buddha. So it's the true, it's the true Buddha. You are the deity. You are the mind of the Buddha. Now, because one has the empty form, now you need the mind to sort of enliven that form. Now one circles one's hands clasped in the mudra above one's head, thereby creating a moon disk behind one in which the true deity, elsewhere called the jnanasattva or the gnosis deity, is reflected in this moon disk behind you. And this image now merges with one's own body while oneself simultaneously merges with it in a dual movement that the commentators are careful to highlight, that both are merging with each other. Uh, this merging is accomplished as one touches the middle fingers of this mudra to four points on one's body while reciting the Sanskrit mantra, O Vajrasat V, uh, empower me. Vaj uh, Sattva Vajri Aditishtasva Mam, at each point. And with this accomplished, one generates pride in oneself as an actual Buddha now by reciting, I am the great deity. And finally, one, uh, one closes this short rit ritual sequence by reciting, Samayoham, I am the deity. Here I want to suggest that this final pronouncement, I am the deity, is meant to communicate a sense of closure that engenders in the practitioner a strong experience of herself as the deity. Ananda Garba, an Indian commentator on the Sarvatathagata Satpasangraha, which is the tantric system behind this particular ritual, Ananda Garba explains that this final Samayo Hum, I am the deity, mantra, is, quote, a display of the accomplishment of the Mahamudra, of the form of, of, of the real deity, you're now the deity, having finally arisen, end quote. The, the power of the pronouncement to, this, to affect this experience would seem to reside partly in its allusion to the beginning of the, this final fifth, I am the deity, that it alludes to the first, you are the deity. And it's echoing of this earlier statement, samayastvam, that opened this, this particular ritual sequence. The two lines are nearly identical, both semantically and sonically. They are almost the same in meaning and how they sound. They, are, they also both rhyme and share the same number of syllables, samayastvam, samayoham. In these ways, the sequence makes use of both the visual image of a mirror here behind the, in the form of the, the moon uh, and an oral echo, mirror and echo. These are significant tools for the Buddhist philosophical views that underpin these rites insist that one is always already divine and that rituals of union such as the, one, the present one are simply ritualized acknowledgments of one's inherent identity with the deity. They're merely mirroring or echoing what is already the case. Just as one both merges into the deity reflected in the mirror and vice versa, the deity merges into oneself, so the two statements, you are the deity and I am the deity, samayastvam and samayoham, echo one another as sounds that are at once the same and different. The first opening statement, opening the sequence, and the second sealing it. The image of the mirror is itself in this sense mirrored in the very structure of the sequence, which is almost chiastic, right? A, B, B, A, sort of, it goes in a circle kind of. It's symmetry centering on the key moment of union, line three. the moment of union that is no union, where first person and second person dissolve at the center of a symmetry that communicates a hidden emphasis. This, the passage seems to tell us, is the heart of the ritual. It's mysterious import highlighted by the repetition of the two statements. I'm reminded here of uh, God's much commented upon answer when Moses asks, uh, asks in his name, I am that I am, ehie asher ehie. <clears throat> Note, too, that the practitioner may feel some devotion toward her tut tutelary deity when she pronounces the first statement, you are the deity. If so, 
The final pronouncement, I am the deity, may translate the practitioner's early devotion into a sense of her own authority as the deity herself. We might also consider whether this powerful sense of the reader's own authority may be further enhanced by the final pronouncement's relationship to another statement. Just before the final, I am the deity, one generates pride by stating, I am the great deity. Might we detect here a utilization of the emotional nuances of pride? Pride, after all, would seem to indicate, uh, would seem to include a comparative element. Pride is always pride over others. In Buddhist texts, pride usually constitutes one of the six root afflictions, so that commentators sometimes feel it necessary to reassure their readers that this divine pride of the present context is not the ordinary afflicted pride. Nonetheless, the fact that this sometimes needs to be clarified is, is itself significant. Pride is often slightly unsure of itself. If pride is the flip side of insecurity, then the prideful penultimate statement, I am the great deity, may not provide quite the sense of closure and true unity with the deity that the ritual seeks to impart. And it's for this reason, perhaps, that the final pronouncement, I am the deity, is both still necessary and so emotionally effective. Its simpler form takes for granted one's identity with the deity. It's no longer a claim, but a statement. It is sure of itself. While this passage uh, in the Tibetan may not be overtly poetic, it's not after all written in verse, it does not use metaphors and so on, except for the mirror, the richness of the images and the resonances of the mantras are clearly meant to combine, uh, me meant to combine to produce a convincing experience of oneself as the deity. I would even argue that the evocative use of language deployed at this point in the ritual may be taken as a marker of what was deemed the most significant moment of the sadhana. When the register of the, uh, the when the changes to the poetic in these early manuals. Again and again, something important is happening. And indeed, more or less the same procedure for the practitioner to install the samaya, meaning the mind of awakening, the mind of the Buddha, into her own body, also appears at the heart of the initiation into this same tantric system. The Sarvatathagata Tattva Sangraha itself, the tantra uh, that this manual is based on, describes the culmination of its initiation right in terms of the master placing this same Vajrasattva mudra upside down on the initiate's head to install this samaya, the, the, the Vajrasattva, the mind of the Buddha, into her heart. Oh, where's my slide? This is it. I got it in the opposite order, I think. Uh, the master should pronounce, quote, now you have entered the family of the Tathagatas, I will generate within you the Vajra Gnosis, and by means of that Gnosis, you will attain the accomplishment of all the Tathagatas. Then the Vajra Master himself binds the Vajra Sattva Mudri and places it pointing downward on top the head of the Vajra student, saying, this is your Samaya, Sattva, uh, Samaya Vajra. If you tell anyone about it, it will split your head. And now Vajra Sattva himself abides at your heart. And in his uh, eighth century commentary to this same tantra, Shakyamitra, the Indian master, uh, makes it explicit that this initiatory moment is equivalent to the subsequent sadhana's uh, procedure for avesha, for installing the mind of the deity that we've, that we've examined here. In this sense, the practitioner of, this, of our Dunhuang sadhana seeks to reenact her original initiation, to return to this original transmission that she received from her master. And I would argue that this, the idea of an immediate transmission of awakening from master to disciple took root in Buddhism around rituals such as this. Such then is the key moment of awakening for this early uh, Yoga Tantra ritual system. And it is marked in our text by a shift in linguistic register, a slowing down of the language into a more poetic mode that is used to achieve the breakthrough. A slightly later 
uh, stage of ritual development is, re is reflected in the manuals on the so-called Maha Yoga Tantras, the greater Yoga Tantras. These date from, from later in the 8th century than the one we just looked at and exhibit the rise of poetic language even more clearly. More and more, the instructions we read strive to communicate a vivid experience of the imagined world of the awakened Buddhas. Thus we read lines like this, mindfulness, liveliness, striving, the speech, the speech, look, the earrings, the choker, the limbs, the movement, the movement, look. On the base, the Vajra seed syllables, the blazing, the blazing, look. I've already mentioned uh, Robert Scharf's warnings against assuming that experience plays too central a role in pre-modern Buddhist practice. Elsewhere, he simply, similarly warns against too strong a visual or phenomenological, as he calls it, interpretation of these kinds of tantric practices. He suggests that in Japan, at least, the tantric ritual manuals of the Shingon school were read less as guides for internal visualization than as uh, liturgies that served at most to imply an imaginative universe in only the vaguest sense. Such a vague general way of reading tantric manuals, Scharf argues, stands in contrast to that of most contemporary scholars who apply instead a phenomenological model that's, quote, enmeshed in an approach to the subject that privileges the inner experience of the practitioner over the performative and the sacerdotal dimensions of the right, end quote. While Scharf may or may not be right about Japan, I don't know, and I, for one, do appreciate his warnings about modernist or Protestant-inspired prejudices coloring our readings of Buddhist literature, it's clear that tantric practice within the Indian and Tibetan cultural context did involve some phenomenological elements, especially from the 8th century on. Manuals such as the one shown here go to great lengths to describe the, detailed, uh, the details of scenes and deities that are to be distinctly cultivated, selwar gom, and distinctly arranged, selwar ke, in one's mind. So before uh, concluding, it's a lengthy conclusion, I want to lead you through one last example. In part, I'm interested in this thing of close reading that I'm trying to do, just because in Tibetan Buddhist studies, nobody does this. Um, so I want to do that one more time. Uh, and here we'll look at this last moment of dissolution when the practitioner's entire field of experience, this imagined scene, has collapsed back into emptiness, the ultimate state of Buddhahood. This moment may be accomplished in a ver variety of ways and usually occurs toward the end of the proceedings, not surprisingly. Uh, like the state of union with the deity examined already, such moments of dissolution often seem to impart a distinct sense of closure. Here I want to introduce two closely related examples. They were written by close associates living around Dunhuang in the second half of the 10th century. The two manuscripts were found together in the same bundle. They share the same size paper with ornamental holes in the same positions on their pages. In composing their manuals furthermore, both authors were improvising on a much shorter manual translated from Sanskrit that also appears in the Dunhuang collection. So despite all these shared origins, however, the two manuals take quite different approaches to this key moment of dissolution. Indeed, it's precisely the closeness of these two uh, texts that allow us to appreciate where they diverge, points of difference that are wholly one of compositional style and poetic license. The visualization that is to be, dissol uh, th that is to be dissolved is of oneself as the deity, resting with a female deity. The practitioners of these rites were usually male. Earlier in the manuals, we're told that a gnosis deity, this mind of the Buddha, the true Buddha, sits, uh, a, this, a thumb-sized deity representing the mind of the Buddha, sits at your heart. You are the, the Buddha with the little Buddha, mini-me, sitting at your heart. At his heart, in turn, rests a barley seed-sized vajra, a ritual implement that carries much significance within tantric Buddhism. There you go. Within the central ball of this Vajra, which is inside the heart of the little me, inside here, um, which serves as the implement's handle, rests a still tinier, the size of a mustard seed now, hum syllable right there. Okay. At the beginning of the ritual, the original generation of this entire visualization was built up from this min minute hum syllable, 
step by step through the spreading of light and coming back, kind of like what we saw, uh, into the full-size body of the Buddha with whom one is identified. In order to enact the dissolution now, both manuals simply reverse this movement so that one's own divine form dissolves into the Vajra at one's heart, uh, which then dissolves into the Hum at it, its heart, and finally the Hum dissolves into emptiness. The big difference between the two manuals under discussion comes with how exactly this mustard seed-sized Hum is dissolved into emptiness. One manual describes the process in considerable detail, leading the reader through the gradual dissolution of each element in the syllable, from the vowel marker at the bottom, the sweeping mark, um, uh, from the vowel, uh, vowel marker at, at the bottom through the body of the ha, uh, right up to the last p disappearing point in which the topmost flourish culminates. So the passage reads as follows. Then regather in accordance with the system of yoga, dissolving everything from the lights that were emanated throughout the universe to the light at the top uh, at, at, of the flourish at the tip of the hum syllable into both the male and female deities. The female deity thus dissolves into the male. The male then dissolves into the gnosis being at your heart. The gnosis being then dissolves into the vajra emblem. The vajra emblem then dissolves into the hum within its handle. The hum dissolves into the vowel marker at the bottom uh, of the syllable. The vowel marker then dissolves into the ha. The ha dissolves into the crescent moon near the top. The crescent moon dissolves into the circle. Remember, this is what we're talking about. Um, the, the crescent moon dissolves into the circle. Uh, and then the circle dissolves into the flourish and thus into the concentration, this meditative state on thusness, the empty space of phenomena, no self. So here the practitioner is led through a series of increasingly minute images from the universe to the two deities to just the male deity to the gnosis deity at one's heart to the vajra at one's heart, at, at his heart to the hum syllable at its center and then through the careful disappearance of each element of the syllable up to the subtlest of points atop the flourish at the highest point, and then into emptiness. A gradual and delicate movement is communicated. The second manual takes an entirely different approach to the dissolution. Now, when the practitioner reaches the final dissolution of the hum, the, she, one, an, he annihilates it in a sudden rush. Having accomplished the aims of all sentient beings through this ritual, one recites some harana hum, regather hum, whereby the principal male deity utterly dissolves into the female deity, and the female deity also utterly dissolves into the male. The male deity utterly dissolves into the thumb-sized gnosis deity at his heart. The thumb-sized gnosis deity utterly dissolves into the barley seed-sized vajra, the va barley seed side vajra utterly dissolves into the mustard seed size hum, then recite a prolonged hum, whereby the hum, like a charging herd of horses of the mind, utterly dissolves right up to the flourish into the concentration on thusness, as was described earlier, the space of phenomena. The f metaphor, like a charging herd of horses of the mind, makes clear the dramatic strength and swiftness of the mental event. Note, too, how each occurrence of the verb dissolves is now accompanied by the intensifying adverb utterly, a detail that is absent from the first manual's more measured account. It is a change, moreover, that alters how the text sounds, keeping in mind uh, that these manuals are typically read out loud or at least whispered, as the practitioner enacts their instructions. The adverb utterly is pronounced timgi, thereby doubling the impact of the verb itself, dissolve, uh, which is similarly pronounced tim. Thus, each of these sentences ends with timgi tim, Tibetan being a verb final language, and uh, with this repeated phrase leading up to the final, powerfully pronounced hum. In all these ways, this passage communicates a far more forceful, sudden dissolution into emptiness. The two manuals may have been held to, re to reach a similar result, 
but through strikingly different means. Both the slow delicacy of the first manual's dissolution and the rushing collapse of the second seek to undercut the reader's senses and leave her suspended in a, a state of emptiness. Our examination of these two passages reveals an interest not only in subjective experience, but in representing that experience. The use of the simile, like a charging herd of horses, already draws the reader out of the usual instructional imperative mode, typical of most of the manual, by surprising her with Im imagery. The simile tells her this is not just about what to do, but how to do it. Elsewhere, the same two manuals instruct the reader to, quote, imagine a white ah in the space of the sky, glittering like Venus, end quote. Elsewhere, again, one should gaze lustfully at the goddess and sing verses of praise in a melody that a later exegete describes as having a tone that should be intense and forceful like thunder. The syllables are to be recited fast and intensely like water rushing off the face of a cliff, writes a later commentary, uh, commentator. In all such imagery, the manual's authors seek to represent not only the ritual procedures, but a certain experience of them. All right. <clears throat> In my readings above, I've tried to attend closely to the language used at particular moments in some early tantric manuals. Such careful attention to the moments of both union with the deity and the final dissolution of the visualization reveals a common interest on the part of the authors in representing and engendering in their readers certain what we might call phenomenological states. If this is true, then we may, may further suggest that the tantric shift in, introduced into Buddhist ritual manuals a level of imagination and interiority that went far beyond what Scharf is called the merely performative or sacerdotal. At the heart of even the most elaborate rites lay moments of affective experience that were clearly deemed to be of central importance. I would suggest that the emergence of these moments is highly significant to the history of Buddhist practice. Such poetically inspired moments were accompanied by an unprecedented interest in the ritual subject, in subjectivity, and the interior worlds of mind and body, in imaginative processes, internal bodily spaces, and increasingly in later years than we've looked at here, the energies, the breaths that flow through those spaces. All this as well, a, sec a rhetoric of secrecy that was unprecedented in Buddhism, and the idea of teachers transmitting their realization directly to a chosen disciple, and thereby too, of lineages of these transmissions spanning multiple generations. By the end of the eighth century, the Indian scholar Buddhinyanapada was writing explicitly of, quote, the great pith instruction of the master and non-meditation itself, inexpressible, without letters, without words, being transferred from ear to ear, that is from teacher to disciple. Here one might object, saying that many, if not all of these themes are seen outside of tantric Buddhism, perhaps most notably in the Chinese Chan tradition, there too we see poetic expressions meant to evoke experiences of awakening. Teachers transmitting these experiences to chosen disciples in private encounters and extended lineages consisting of such transmissions. To such an observation, I would only say yes. And look at when these ideas first came on the scene. Only in the seventh and especially eighth centuries do we begin to see all of this emerging in China. Consider the proliferation of precept ordination platforms and precept ceremonies in precisely this period. I'm not arguing that we should call these Chinese developments tantric, but I am suggesting that the paradigm shift that occurred in Buddhist practice around this time had ramifications across all of Mahayana Buddhism and that it was interpreted differently in various cultural contexts. Over the next few centuries in India and Tibet, we see a gradual growth in interest among tantric Buddhists in rites and poetic expressions that impart particular experiences. Here I'm thinking not only of these private sadhana based practices we've looked at, but of the famous dohas or songs of experience as they've been called, uh, of the pointing out instructions like we opened with that are so central to the traditions of Dzogchen and Mahamudra and so on. One might still object that despite all this, Buddhists remained suspicious of meditative experience, or even that they did not see such poetic moments as important to progress on the path. 
Certainly, I do not mean to deny that such suspicions continue, even today, to be part of Buddhism. Many Buddhist texts would seem to agree with Scharf that subjective experiences, visions, or bodily experiences are irrelevant at best and dangerously misleading at worst. Earlier, I mentioned in passing the moods or rasas, uh, this theory of Indian aesthetics. In fact, that goes back to the turn of the millennium. In fact, we see these same moods, these same rasas, playing a central role in the belletristic traditions of Tibet too, from at least the 13th century on. There, however, they're cordoned off from Buddhism proper, relegated to the realm of poetics, nyengak, which is one of the five minor sciences, rikne chung nga. Here's the list. Poetics is just one of them. They're all the non-Buddhist uh, areas of study. As such, Tibetans considered poetics and aesthetics worldly, or perhaps we might say secular, disciplines. Worldly here translates the term, the Sanskrit term laukika in the Tibetan jiktembe, and it implies that poetics cannot lead to Buddhist awakening. Poetry may lead to all sorts of refined states of pleasure, pain, sadness, and so on, but not beyond all this to nirvana. All this makes sense to monastic sensibilities that tend to view poetry in a rather puritanical light as mere ornamentation, gyan or alankara, that is extraneous to the singular, truly Buddhist aim of transcending such, warning, uh, such subjective experiences. Vinaya rules against monks singing songs and dancing are well known, while warnings abound against attachment to experiences that arise as signs of meditative progress. All such things, we're told, are merely the results of one's karma and therefore not to be engaged. While this may be uh, the standard party line for monastic Buddhism, we find a very different approach when we turn to tantric Buddhism. There we see ritualized dancing and singing, the clapping of hands fe the feasting and feasting being recommended at the end of one's daily meditations from early on. We may even observe that the nine moods or these navarasa of Indian aesthetics are not found anywhere in Buddhist scripture until, once again, the eighth century with the influential uh, Sarva Buddha Sama Yoga Tantra. And from there, they spread widely throughout the tantric literature. While some early tantric authors make it clear that the Buddhas only enact these nine rasas, these nine moods as an upaya, a skillful means to draw non-Buddhists into the fold. Others take their role, the role of these nine rasas, as gateways to awakening, as gateways to awakening more seriously. The Sarva Buddha Sama Yoga itself claims that each of these nine moods leads to union with a particular Buddha. And here's the passage with song, symbols, and dance, with gestures and the sentiments, namely eroticism, these are the nine, hero heroism, compassion, humor, ferocity, terror, disgust, wonder, and tranquility, one's aims will be achieved. By being endowed with the sentiments of eroticism, etc., dancing with the various uh, gestures, and by uniting oneself with all, one will achieve all states of possession of, of union, uh, of Asia. Eroticism corresponds to Vajrasattva, heroism to the hero Tathagata, compassion to Vajradhara, humor to Lokeshvara, ferocity to Vajrasurya, and so on. And this last one is interesting. Uh, and tranquility, Shanta, always corresponds to the Buddha since it pacifies all suffering. And here, uh, in bolding this, this line in the middle, one will achieve all states of possession. I want to highlight the role of avesha, of the Buddha's possession of the practitioner. Each poetic mode thus opens one for each of these Buddhas to enter into the interior of one's body. Avesha means it enters into you. Here we could go down an entire uh, avenue uh, until we, until, uh, sorry, a, a different avenue of exploration at, uh, until by, there's some misprint here, sorry. Uh, by exploring the central role of Avesha in Tantric Buddhism, of the true Buddha, the mind of awakening, dwelling within one's heart. But for now, we may simply note the links between poetry, subjective experience, and interiority. Here again, we see the influence of the register of the hidden and the imaginary. 
What's more, uh, we may note that these rasas, which originated in early Indian writings about drama, initi initially num numbered only eight. So going back to the Natya Shastra, there's only eight. And only with the ninth century writings of Ananda Vardhana is the ninth Shanta Rasa, the last one, added to the list. This means that the Tantric Buddhists were very early adopters of these nine Rasas, and especially this ninth Rasa. And uh, since it's only appearing in literary theory in the ninth century, and we have it in eighth century Tantra. This means, uh, um, and this is fur further uh, confirmed by the appearance of the nine in the Dunhuang documents, materials that also reflect the stage in Indian ritual development corresponding to the late eighth century. In Indian aesthetics, moreover, this ninth Shanta Rasa, or peaceful pa Rasa, was the religious Rasa, described by Abhinavagupta as the master Rasa that, quote, transforms aesthetic ex enjoyment or aesthetic relishing temporarily into the sensation of that obscuration of the true nature of self, which is caused by the thick darkness of ignorance, end quote. This was a moment, the Shanta Rasa, in other words, when the lines between religious experience and aesthetics were blurring, when religious experience was being carried into the realm of literature and literary theory, as we see here, was shaping tantric practice. Of course, many Buddhists claimed that such moods were deployed by the Buddhas only as expedient means for converting non-Buddhists, that they were not really the main point, but they could be used as stepping stones, repurposed as gateways to more transcendent uh, breakthroughs. And in any case, I would argue that the tantric acceptance of such methods in the eighth century was part of a larger shift towards subjectivity, poetic expression, and the effective moments engendered by such experience, uh, expressions. That some were careful to point out the worldly or laukika place of such elements only shows how new this tantric emphasis on aesthetics and subjective experience really was. Whether poetic language really can cause a breakthrough of a uh, moment of awakening remains a point of uh, contention. Hence, in part, the sudden gradual debate of the eighth, of eighth century Tibet or similar arguments between the northern and southern uh, schools of Chan about the need for meditation and ritual practice. One author from Dunhuang ends his ritual manual by explaining, quote, I have elaborated this entire sadhana, this entire ritual manual, only for the benefit of those feeble-minded practitioners who heard the Tantra but didn't have the fortune to understand it, end quote. In an ideal world then, we would all gain awakening with our very first exposure to the Buddhist teaching. For the rest, ritual, poetry, and a focus on aesthetic experience may be what we're left with. Thanks. We have 10 minutes for questions. Yeah, sorry I ran over. Sorry, just a simple question. What, what is the word for initiation in this, in, as you've been using it? Uh, in Sanskrit, it's Abhisheka, and Good. in Tibetan, Wong. That, that's Wong. what I wondered. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, so I appreciated and found persuasive your close reading of the text. So I have comparative questions in two dimensions. So one is you talked about these as representing a paradigm shift across Mahayana Buddhism. And do you see it as restricted to Mahayana Buddhism? Because there has been scholarship about similar kinds of ritual forms, practices, esoteric performative dimensions within What's, you know, what's called the Theravada as well. Kate Crosby and other folks have been working on that. And I wonder to what degree you see how similar the resonances are. Because it seems to me that they're not, they're not identical, but there are resonances. The other comparative question is about, you know, your initial framing was in terms of sort of the modern, you use two languages, the modern and the pre-modern, and also sort of Western modernity and alternative modernities. And I'm just sort of wondering, I mean, it does seem to me that like claims that obviously like subjectivity and interiority have significance right outside of pre-enlightenment west so i'm wondering how you're using that contrast because it, it it seems to me that the question is more about like 
the value of interiority and subjectivity, its social dimensions, its even phenomenological, epistemological, ontological implications, and the way those are tied up in different kinds of social historical projects. And it seems, you know, uh, it seems like that sort of unpacking the different dimensions of experience, you know, uh, and how they're taken up in different times and places. Yeah. Those are both great questions I'm not going to answer. <laughs> um, uh, the first one about Theravadan Buddhism, I mean, I would love to get some of those references, but, you know, I already feel like I'm making a pretty, uh, you know, large-scale argument here, and definitely as a Tibetanist talking about India and for that matter, you know, all of Asia, like, you know, there, there's a point where my expertise and knowledge just starts to break down, and I just wanted to limit it a little bit to Mahayana Buddhism. <laughs> um, but I, I would be very interested to know more about what's going on outside of Mahayana. Um, and then the second thing about, I mean, I, my use of sharks, by the way, I, I think, you know, I, it's kind of beating a dead horse. Like, I, I think everybody at this point recognizes that there's limitations to, to his critique. They were very useful at the time, but and still are. Um, really, the, I was using him primarily along the lines that you were saying, just to sort of nod towards the idea that in some ways this is similar to what happened in, from the 18th century in Europe on, and in some ways different, and uh, just to kind of frame it in those terms. I mean, really this all started for me or one of the turning points was when I was in the, uh, at the part of the Townsend Center for Humanities and I talked about literary readings of ritual manuals, like these close readings, which I had, I'd never thought of before. And I was inspired by the fact that I didn't know, but it turns out if you're with a bunch of people in the humanities, they're all literature people. Nobody else was very into history like I was. But, so I was trying to be like one of them, you know? And then somebody put up their hand and said, you know, you keep talking about literary readings of eighth century Indian and Tibetan ritual manuals, but li the literary is a modern Western category, so what are you doing? And basically, I totally disagreed, but I also kind of found that that was kind of one of the best questions because it made me realize like, oh yeah, there's something much larger scale I'm doing here, which is, uh, exploring a, a, an area where there are similarities and, of course, many differences between West to West modernity and subjectivity and so on, modern subjectivity and so on. Where, you know, where exactly the similarities and differences are, you know, I, like I say, I'm going to avoid the question <laughs> because just to lay out the evidence and it's an interesting question though. Um, I was attracted to this, uh, to your talk, uh, uh, because of the um, introduction of poetry um, as a uh, way of um, uh, experiencing um, all those levels that you described or categorized, and. Well, what you said uh, was that uh, there is resistance, there was resistance to uh, having that as a way of approaching perhaps some of those levels of uh, experience. Um, so why was there a resistance uh, and um, how does this resistance relate to the sophisticated methods? Uh, there is, I mean, this is not for a common man to do. This is for the priest. This is, I can't uh, do this. Uh, I mean, I, as a layman, uh, this is, you know, for them. But poetry is very immediate. Um, and even the ones that you uh, you translated, these are not in Sanskrit or they're not in uh, the language. Um, um, how is that correct? Yeah. Uh, 
I mean, I think that the, the, the fact that poetry is both used and resisted actually points to a serious philosophical question that plagues these Buddhists and Western authors in the 18th century. I mean, I've been reading on the sublime and this is kind of in Western aesthetics, kind of a moment, in a, in a way you can understand it as a moment when the religious experience is translated into a, the secular realm of aesthetics, but it's also a point where aesthetics kind of, it's a question of whether the sublime is part of aesthetics or not. It's a place where aesthetics breaks down. And the question is what's the relationship between aesthetics and the sublime and postmodern writers have written about it in really interesting ways um, that, that highlight the fact that it's, it's both and neither. You can't get to the sublime through aesthetics and yet it is somehow part of aesthetics. And does poetry lead you beyond poetry or not? It's, you know, these kind of paradoxes that, and, and I think it's a question of philosophy and religious thought that Western scholars and philosophers have struggled with and literary theorists and I think that they are too. I don't think it's as simple as poetry's the answer, man, you know, that'll get you enlightened. Like that's too simplistic too, you know. Poetry can make you feel good or feel bad or something. The question is, can it do something else? I don't know. I mean that's a that's a real question. Well you talked about uh, the uh, uh, experience and the experience uh, and repetition of this experience. So, uh, well, what poetry is like is uh, you do to beyond poetry or uh, practices on uh, what gives you uh, enlightenment. Um, it's um, irrelevant if it's, uh, if it's uh, related to the experience itself. So when you're making the point of the experience that you experience, Right. Is what you say enjoy it or you felt bad? Actually, uh, what you're talking about is a little bit also another inspiration for me getting into all this is, you know, when I'm reading these old manuscripts, there are moments where I kind of like, wow, that was really beautiful or wow, that's really cool the way that chiastic structure works. But being, you know, trained as a conservative philologist and, you know, <laughs> In Buddhist studies, like, I'm trained to just kind of breathe over that stuff, like, oh, that was an interesting thought that popped up in my head. I'm going to ignore that as a historical circumstance and keep going. And, you know, instead, uh, you know, maybe thanks to my training, I stopped and thought, wait, wait, why am I ignoring that? You know, there's actually something going on there. Why am I overlooking what's actually the text is doing to me? And so, you know, that's why I'm interested in these close readings and sort of picking apart. Is there anything slightly more objective that can be said about how these texts do that. And instead of just saying, oh, I felt this way, you know, actually say something and literary studies has all kinds of tools for doing that, that I am only just recently learning. On that note, let's thank Richard. Thank you. <laughs>